Chapter 7 The author leaves Legado, arrives at Maldonada. No ship ready. He takes a short voyage to Glubdubdrib. His reception by the governor. The continent, of which this kingdom is a part, extends itself, as I have reason to believe, eastward, to that unknown tract of America westward of California, and north, to the Pacific Ocean, which is not above 150 miles from Legado, where there is a good port, and much commerce with the great island of Lugnag, situated to the northwest about 29 degrees north latitude, and 140 longitude. This island of Lugnag stands southeastward of Japan, about a hundred leagues distant. There is a strict alliance between the Japanese emperor and the king of Lugnag, which affords frequent opportunities of sailing from one island to the other. I determined therefore to direct my course this way, in order to my return to Europe. I hired two mules, with a guide, to show me the way, and carry my small baggage. I took leave of my noble protector, who had shown me so much favor, and made me a generous present at my departure. My journey was without any accident or adventure worth relating. When I arrived at the port of Maldonada, for so it is called, there was no ship in the harbor bound for Lognag, nor likely to be in some time. The town is about as large as Portsmouth. I soon fell into some acquaintance, and was very hospitably received. A gentleman of distinction said to me, that since the ships bound for Lugnag could not be ready in less than a month, it might be no disagreeable amusement for me to take a trip to the little island of Glubbubdrib, about five leagues off to the southwest. He offered himself and a friend to accompany me, and that I should be provided with a small convenient bark for the voyage. Glubbubdrib, as nearly as I can interpret the word, signifies the island of sorcerers or magicians. It is about one-third as large as the Isle of Wight, and extremely fruitful, it is governed by the head of a certain tribe, who are all magicians. This tribe marries only among each other, and the eldest in succession is prince or governor. He has a noble palace, and a park of about 3,000 acres, surrounded by a wall of hewn stone 20 feet high. In this park are several small enclosures for cattle, corn, and gardening. The governor and his family are served and attended by domestics of a kind somewhat unusual. By his skill in necromancy he has a power of calling whom he pleases from the dead, and commanding their service for 24 hours, but no longer, nor can he call the same persons up again in less than three months, except upon very extraordinary occasions. When we arrived at the island, which was about 11 in the morning, one of the gentlemen who accompanied me went to the governor, and desired admittance for a stranger, who came on purpose to have the honor of attending on his highness. This was immediately granted and we all three entered the gate of the palace between two rows of guards, armed and dressed after a very antic manner, and with something in their countenances that made my flesh creep with a horror I cannot express. We passed through several apartments, between servants of the same sort, ranked on each side as before, till we came to the chamber of presence, where, after three profound obeisances, and a few general questions, we were permitted to sit on three stools, near the lowest step of His Highness's throne. He understood the language of Balnabarbi, although it was different from that of this island. He desired me to give him some account of my travels, and, to let me see that I should be treated without ceremony, he dismissed all his attendants with a turn of his finger, at which, to my great astonishment, they vanished in an instant, like visions in a dream when we awake on a sudden. I could not recover myself in some time, till the governor assured me, that I should receive no hurt, and observing my two companions to be under no concern, who had been often entertained in the same manner. I began to take courage, and related to His Highness a short history of my several adventures, yet not without some hesitation, and frequently looking behind me to the place where I had seen those domestic specters. I had the honor to dine with the governor, where a new set of ghosts served up the meat, and waited at table. I now observed myself to be less terrified than I had been in the morning. I stayed till sunset, but humbly desired His Highness to excuse me for not accepting his invitation of lodging in the palace. My two friends and I lay at a private house in the town adjoining, which is the capital of this little island, and the next morning we returned to pay our duty to the governor, as he was pleased to command us. After this manner we continued in the island for ten days, most part of every day with the governor, and at night in our lodging. I soon grew so familiarized to the sight of spirits, that after the third or fourth time they gave me no emotion at all, or, if I had any apprehensions left, my curiosity prevailed over them. For His Highness the Governor ordered me to call up whatever persons I would choose to name, and in whatever numbers, among all the dead from the beginning of the world to the present time, and command them to answer any questions I should think fit to ask, with this condition, that my questions must be confined within the compass of the times they lived in. And one thing I might depend upon, that they would certainly tell me the truth, for lying was a talent of no use in the lower world.
I made my humble acknowledgments to His Highness for so great a favor. We were in a chamber, from whence there was a fair prospect into the park. And because my first inclination was to be entertained with scenes of pomp and magnificence, I desired to see Alexander the Great at the head of his army, just after the Battle of Arbilla, which, upon a motion of the governor's finger, immediately appeared in a large field, under the window where we stood. Alexander was called up into the room, it was with great difficulty that I understood his Greek, and had but little of my own. He assured me upon his honor that he was not poisoned, but died of a bad fever by excessive drinking. Next, I saw Hannibal passing the Alps, who told me he had not a drop of vinegar in his camp. I saw Caesar and Pompey at the head of their troops, just ready to engage. I saw the former, in his last great triumph. I desired that the Senate of Rome might appear before me, in one large chamber, and an assembly of somewhat a later age encounter view, in another. The first seemed to be an assembly of heroes and demigods, the other, a knot of peddlers, pickpockets, highwaymen, and bullies. The governor, at my request, gave the sign for Caesar and Brutus to advance towards us. I was struck with a profound veneration at the sight of Brutus, and could easily discover the most consummate virtue, the greatest intrepidity and firmness of mind, the truest love of his country, and general benevolence for mankind, in every lineament of his countenance. I observed, with much pleasure, that these two persons were in good intelligence with each other, and Caesar freely confessed to me, that the greatest actions of his own life were not equal, by many degrees, to the glory of taking it away. I had the honor to have much conversation with Brutus, and was told, that his ancestor Junius, Socrates, Epaminondas, Cato the Younger, Sir Thomas More, and himself were perpetually together, a sextumvirate, to which all the ages of the world cannot add a seventh. It would be tedious to trouble the reader with relating what vast numbers of illustrious persons were called up to gratify that insatiable desire I had to see the world in every period of antiquity placed before me. I chiefly fed mine eyes with beholding the destroyers of tyrants and usurpers, and the restorers of liberty to oppressed and injured nations. But it is impossible to express the satisfaction I received in my own mind, after such a manner as to make it a suitable entertainment to the reader.